Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for Scientists in Action Wild Weather. By my watch, it is 11 o'clock mountain time, and that means it is time for us to get underway. So I will kick us off with a couple hellos and a couple of quick housekeeping items. I do want to say a little introduction about myself. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am connected today to Dr. Karen Kasiba, who is a weather scientist from the Center for Severe Weather Research. So today, we're going to get to talk to her and learn a little bit about the fact fascinating job that she has helping to predict some of nature's coolest and strongest storms. But before we get started, just a couple of quick things that you need to know. If you are watching in Zoom today, we have a lot of students connected to us from all across the country and even into Canada today. So a couple of messages for you. There are a few things that you can do to interact with us today. Number one, we cannot see you or hear you. Dr. Kasiba and I can interact with you only through the chat, through the Q&A, and through excuse me, some polls. So if you would like to do so, if you haven't already done so already, take a moment to send us a message in that chat and let us know where you're watching from today. It is so cool for us to be able to see where we have people watching from um, and to get to know that you are responding to us. In case you're not seeing any messages come in from other people, that's because as an added security feature, we have your messages going only to us. So you're not gonna see anyone else's chats today. Only Dr. Kasiba and I are gonna be able to see those. Please remember as you send in your questions and comments today to be responsible, to be responsible and respectful. Uh, we need to be able to pull those questions from the chat. So make sure that you're sending us only scientific messages and not anything too spammy or too distracting. Thanks for sending in all of those locations. You can also use the Q&A to tell us uh, what questions you have that you'd like us to answer. I will be watching all the program long and we'll be able to pull those questions to ask Dr. Kasiba live. We also are going to have some polls popping up on your screen in Zoom today that you can use to tell us about the weather that you experience where you live and help guide some of our learning today. So watch for those to pop up throughout the program. We'll tell you when those are coming. You'll be able to cast your vote and help us choose our own adventure. I would also love to say a big hello to our Facebook audience. We are streaming this program live to the DMNS Facebook page today. So Facebook, uh, you can go ahead and leave us a comment and let us know where you are watching from today. Um, and we are not gonna have any polls popping up for you, but you can leave us a comment to tell us about your experience. I have my handy device right here where I will be watching that live stream. So I will be able to see those comments as well. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kasiba. Can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a weather scientist? I see a lot of questions wondering what's going on on the screen already. This is so exciting. Tell us about it. Oh, I was like, my title slide gets questions. Awesome. Um, so welcome. I'm really glad to uh, be talking to everybody virtually today. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few different types of weather phenomena and what types I talk about are going to depend on what you want to hear about. Um, so I am a severe weather scientist. Um, I have a PhD in meteorology. Um, but I do a lot of different things uh, with my job, and I hopefully will show you a few of these in my presentation. So since you said there's questions about um, the first slide up here, uh, this was this is our radar on the back of our radar. If we were doing this in person, I'd have a radar behind me. Um, observing a tornado uh, back in 2009 in Wyoming. Um, it was part of a big project uh, with a bunch of meteorologists called Vortex 2. Um, so just giving you a little a little taste of what's hopefully to come. Uh, so moving forward, um, I'm going to talk about wild weather, and I call it the real storm chasers, um, and I say the real storm scientists, um, not because chasing storms is a bad thing, um, but I just want to differentiate between um, people who are out there, you know, really enjoying nature, taking pictures, um, and people who are out there doing science. And that doesn't also mean that scientists in their free time aren't also out there taking pictures of tornadoes and hurricanes and blizzards as well, um, because we're weather nerds just like uh, everybody else is. Um, and of course the media, I just always love all the different, you know, different types of tornado and natural disaster movies, um, Twister, which actually isn't the worst one. Um, and now I might be dating myself, uh, certainly things like Sharknado, um, and Into the Storm, uh, try to depict, not Sharknado, um, but Into the Storm, try to depict, uh, what some of the science, uh, is out there. Um, but I'll tell you what it's really like out there. And on the right there, if you can see, um, that's, that's what we actually look like out in the field. Um, that's me launching a weather balloon uh, in a hurricane. Um, again, our radar truck uh, by a tornado um, and uh, some of our team deploying instruments near a tornado. And I just want to say too, if anybody's interested in watching more on tornadoes and a little bit more about the science um, with way better uh, video and graphics than I do because I'm a scientist, uh, there's actually an IMAX movie called Tornado Alley, um, which uh, depicts some of this stuff as well. And it's a fun movie. 
uh, for that. So I want to start out, um, I hear people are from all over the country, um, so that might impact uh, what's the wildest weather you've ever experienced. Um, but I just have some examples up here um, of possible weather you might have experienced, uh, either at home or while traveling. Um, certainly things like tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, snowstorms get a lot of attention uh, for severe weather. Um, but there's other types of weather too, like lightning, uh, which also is dangerous, uh, really large hail, um, and depending on where you live and where you might live in the US or Canada, um, you might be more prone to large hail than other places. Uh, there's things like haboobs, dust storms. Um, so if people are tuning in from Arizona or West Texas, uh, these are one of the things that um, are pretty frequent in the region in which you live. Uh, the other thing is fire weather. Um, so in the Western United States, uh, Colorado, Idaho, California, uh, we actually get a lot of wildfires here. And the strange thing about wildfires is that they also could produce their own weather. Uh, so what I have here is a picture of what we call a fire NATO. So you could actually get tornado-like things in these fires. Um, and then, last but not least, maybe you live somewhere that's really quiescent and uh, you have a calm sunny day. That's actually the worst weather you've ever experienced. Uh, so I'm just curious to hear um, what some of the wildest weather people have experienced. And that actually brings us to our first poll. So students, before you pop all of your weather observations in the chat, if you are watching in Zoom, you are gonna see a poll popping up on your screen right about now. So you can let us know what kinds of weather you have experienced in the past. And this is a multiple choice poll. So if you have experienced more than one of these things or more than one of these things happen where you live, you can actually put all of those answers in the poll. And you can also tell us if there's something else that you experience, you can pop that in the chat too. And if you're watching on Facebook, do feel free to leave us a comment. Um, I do already see one on there from Marilyn who says that she is a former Midwesterner who is very glad to be out of Tornado Alley. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have some votes starting to come in and lots of people saying in the chat that they've experienced things like hurricanes, hail, lightning, snowstorms, giant tornadoes, ooh, bomb cyclone. I remember a couple of those happening last spring here in Colorado, really interesting winter weather event. That's pretty fascinating. We're gonna leave this poll open for just about 10 more seconds. Some people are saying things like lightning, dust storms. I'm seeing so many chats come in. Thank you so much for engaging. Amber on Facebook says, hail and tornado sirens entering Oklahoma on a summer trip and then file fire and large hail here in Colorado. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. We're gonna take a look at our results. It looks like most of you have voted for something else. And indeed we are getting a lot of chat messages to tell us what that something else might be. But it looks like people watching today experience all of these kinds of things. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that is really cool. And actually, I could probably guess where some people live based on uh, the type of weather that you experience. Um, here in Colorado, uh, obviously hail is a big thing here, um, and also fire weather, uh, as I was saying. Um, but certainly if you're in places like the Great Plains uh, or the Midwest, um, tornadoes usually um, are something that is more prolific uh, there than in other places. Um, I have experienced almost all of this wild weather. Uh, the one thing, and I'm jealous if somebody wrote this down, is I've never experienced a haboob or a dust storm. Um, so I've always thought that's been really cool to uh, actually experience. Um, I always see video coming out of Arizona um, a lot of times in the monsoon season with these big dust storms. And I always thought that would be cool. Um, so like I said, I've experienced all of that but a haboob. Um, and the reason being is that I study high impact weather. So I study a lot of these different weather phenomena uh, that I just put up there. And there's different ways to study weather. Uh, one of the ways is through observations. Um, so actually taking instruments out in the field and observing these things, observing the lightning, observing the tornado. Uh, and the other thing to do is actually model this. Um, and modeling means not, you know, modeling. <laughs> it means uh, actually doing numerical models. Um, so just like you learn physics in school, basic physics, F equals MA, um, those types of things actually tell you something about the atmosphere. Um, so I put a really complicated equation up there uh, just to have it. But there's a lot of equations that we use to describe the atmosphere, and it takes a lot that goes into these. And as you can see that other picture I had there, that's a bunch of supercomputers. So a lot of these models, sometimes they could run on a desktop. Computers have gotten great these days, but a lot of times they're running on these huge supercomputers um, in order to get these forecasts that you get uh, every day. And then you get something like uh, what I have on the bottom there. Um, I was trying to, trying to pick different places in the US, uh, so uh, an event in California. Um, but again, this is a forecast. This is telling something about what the weather is going to be like in a particular location so people could prepare for it. But neither of these things really could exist by themselves. Um, so modeling is great. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, but modeling needs observations. 
um, both to run the models, but also to make sure that actually what you're modeling is really happening. Um, on the other side, observations don't stand alone either. Um, we can get a lot of observations on stuff, but there's a lot of things that are really difficult or hard to observe. Um, and we need models to actually fill in that gap in our knowledge. So I'd like to say neither of these stand alone. And then I say that and I say, but all I do is observations. <laughs> but the idea, of course, is that I'm taking observations in consultation with people who are doing modeling. Um, so I know a lot of these uh, unanswered questions. Um, so I do observations and I do it with mobile radars uh, and some other stuff, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, so there's another picture of this uh, radar truck, pretend it's behind me. Um, observing the same tornado uh, in Wyoming. This happened to be a very picturesque tornado. Um, trust me, all my other tornado pictures are... <laughs> I'm sitting in the back of a radar truck, so I'm not looking out the window. Um, but real quick, just a quick segue on what a radar actually is. And some of you might be familiar with it. Um, and you might be familiar with it even if you don't know you're familiar with it. Um, so a lot of times on TV, when you're getting a weather forecast and the meteorologist on TV is talking to you, they show you a radar image and you see a lot of greens and blues and stuff like that. And they say it's going to rain um, or it is raining. Um, and radar is really what I call just a flashlight on the atmosphere. Um, so basically, it's just sending out pulses of energy at anything that's in the atmosphere. So whether it's raindrop or hail or snow, um, these energy, it hits these molecules, bounces back. And then we're able to get a lot of information about what's going on. We're able to get information about how much of that stuff it is. So if it's raining really heavily or if it's snowing really heavily, uh, we'll get that back from radar. And then we also get wind information. So we get some idea of how the snowflakes or the hail or the rain are moving in the atmosphere. And with that information, we can understand a lot about what's going on. Um, so not only can we use it as a tool to tell people what's happening, but we could also use it as a tool to understand what's happening. Um, and so I just have a quick little example here of a tornado, since you're getting a little theme here. Um, and the big difference between our radar and other radars that you're familiar with is that we just get close. Um, so other radars are stationary, they're all across the country, they're all across Canada, um, but they're pretty sparse. And if you're actually trying to observe a weather phenomenon to understand it, you have to wait a really long time for it to pass close enough to your radar to actually observe it in enough detail to really understand what's going on besides just sort of monitoring the weather. Um, so really what we're doing is we're just getting really, really close or inside sometimes to the things that we're studying. Um, so for example, tornadoes, and you might see a lot of these in the presentation, um, really are just you know cones, right? You think of a tornado, all those tornado pictures I showed you, um, they're cones. And if you think of your geometry, if you slice horizontally through a cone, so a radar is just slicing horizontally through like an MRI or a CAT scan or something like that, and what you get then is an ellipse. Um, so when you look at a tornado on radar or you look at something that's rotating on radar, you see sort of this elliptical shape. Um, so if you look at this bottom screen, I just have two examples of these things that I talked about that you observe with radar. One is something that we call reflectivity. And reflectivity really just means how much stuff there is. Um, and like I said, it could be rain, it could be hail in a tornado, it could be dirt, cows, pieces of houses. Um, and really what you just get is some information about how big and how much stuff is there. And then the other thing, um, which I personally find more interesting, is the velocity, so how these things are moving. And since this is a tornado, you could see here um, this pink, these uh, purples, and then they go to pink, and then on the other side you see these browns, and this is just how we color things. This is actually a rotation, this is a tornado. So all these pinks um, are winds that are towards the radar, and all these browns are winds that are away from the radar. And when we see that, um, we're looking at a tornado. Um, on a larger scale, sometimes you see that in something that we call mesocyclones, um, which also is a rotation. But that's a really big indication that something is rotating uh, in the atmosphere. So I said we also use a bunch of other stuff. Um, so we have three of these big blue radar trucks. Um, we also have a new fourth big blue radar truck um, that's slightly different uh, and slightly bigger, but it allows us to observe things in a very similar way. And then the other thing that we have are we have an array of instruments. We have something called sounding systems. We have what we call weather pods and we have what we call mesonets. And radar, like I said, tells you something about the wind speed and direction, gives you this nice three-dimensional or two-dimensional map. Um, but what you don't get with this is you don't get information about temperature. You don't get information about relative humidity, which is the water content of the atmosphere. Um, and these things are really important in understanding weather. So besides what you can get with radar, you also want to supplement it with this other type of information. So sounding systems are basically these balloons, um, and then you attach a little instrument package to it, and those go up in the atmosphere, 
um, and they go through the whole depth of the atmosphere. And as the soundings go up, this balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It actually gets to be about the size of a house. And then by the time it gets to the top of the atmosphere and then it pops um, and then it's done. Um, but the whole time that this balloon is going up in the atmosphere, it's transmitting back to a base. Um, so you're getting this information as it goes up through the atmosphere. So that gives you something, it gives you the temperature and the moisture content um, throughout the entire vertical depth. But horizontally, so on a plane, we don't get that information much. So we have something called mesonets, which is this cool little pickup truck here, um, which has weather instruments attached to it. And basically, if we think there's something really cool that we want to know what the temperature and the water content is, we have these people drive back and forth uh, through that to get us information through these types of things. And then the last thing we have is something called weather pods. And these were originally designed to go inside a tornado. So the idea was, and you can see this image here of um, two of our team members uh, running away from the tornado. Um, what they had done is they had put several of these weather instruments in the path of that tornado, um, and then they run away. And hopefully what ends up happening is when the tornado runs over these, um, we get information about wind. So this thing that you see up here is called an anemometer, but then also temperature and water content information, um, which tells us a lot more about what's happening inside of the tornado. And the reason we have 20 of these is because they're really hard to get hit. Um, so we thought the more of them, the better. Um, and hopefully that would just increase our odds of them getting hit by a tornado. Um, what's ended up happening with these is that they've become incredibly useful for studying all types of weather, um, from hurricanes to winter storms to fire weather. Um, we could just set out these instruments and get a really good idea about what the atmosphere is doing um, in terms of the temperature and the water content or the relative humidity. Um, so we've taken our instruments pretty much, well, not everywhere, but a lot of places. Um, maybe we've taken them somewhere near you. Uh, so, especially if you live anywhere from Texas to North Dakota, we most certainly um, have taken them near you. Um, but places like California, the East Coast, um, we've been there as well. We've been hopefully in California to study wildfires in the next year. Um, we've been on the East Coast uh, studying nor'easters. Uh, we've been up in upstate New York looking at lake effect snow. And recently we've gone down to Argentina looking at thunderstorms in Argentina. Um, we've also been across the pond, as they say, um, to uh, Switzerland, Germany. Um, in France, looking at severe storms, looking at uh, thunderstorms in those regions. Um, so I have to laugh, everywhere you go, everybody's like, oh my God, you found so many places, that's so cool. And I'm always like, yes, but I have this big blue radar truck <laughs> that's always with me. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to the beach in Hawaii, um, which we've also gone to. Um, and normally we're deploying in something that looks like this cornfield here. Um, so whether or not that's Kansas, Germany, or Argentina, <laughs> it's all the same to me, um, except when people come and knock on our door. Um, and they're not speaking English. Um, so it's kind of fun going to all these different places and we do actually get out and enjoy stuff, but we are also sitting there waiting our truck usually for 12 hours a day. Um, other examples, um, <laughs> just showing you, uh, this is a lake effect snowstorm that was one of our mesonets that got buried. Um, and then down in the bottom right here, um, that was actually in Idaho um, when we were sitting on two mountaintops uh, looking at winter snow. So our crew actually had to snowmobile up every day um, to the radar in order to operate it and look at um, snow over the mountains in Idaho. So with that, I want to take a quick break and decide which you guys, what you guys want to talk about next or what do you want to hear about next? Um, yes. So in just a moment, we're going to bring another poll up on the screen. And again, I know some people had reported in the chat that they didn't see the poll. And you know what, if you didn't, that's okay. I'm not quite sure why that happened. Could be because we have so many people on this call with us today. But you know what? You all did a great job of putting your answers in the chat, and that's what we needed. We just wanted to know what sorts of weather you experienced. So in case the chat or the poll, excuse me, does not pop up this time, you can always just send your answer into the chat and we will see it. But before we do that, I do have a couple of questions that I would love for you to answer, Dr. Kasiba, if that's okay with you. Certainly. Uh, lots of curious scientists are wondering things about some of the instruments that you use, including um, how do you know when a weather balloon is going to pop or come down? Or is that possible? What happens when the weather balloon is sort of done collecting data? Yeah, weather balloons are actually very interesting. Um, so there's a couple of things. So one of the things is that you have to be a little careful handling the weather balloon. Um, so you don't actually want to get like your oily hands on it and stuff like that. Because as it's going up in the atmosphere, what could happen sometimes is those places that you touch with your really greasy hands um, will actually become weak and it'll pop before we want it to. Um, but what we usually want it to do, and it usually makes it up to the top of the atmosphere, is go all the way up, um, all 12 kilometers to the top of the atmosphere. Uh, and it does. Uh, so you fill it, it's a pretty robust balloon, like I said, except for the oily hand stuff. 
Um, and then it just gets so big um, because the pressure at the top of the atmosphere is so tiny. Um, and that's when it pops. And what happens when it pops is it just falls back down to the earth. Um, and the thing about that is that this is a very um, friendly weather instrument. So again, this is, it's transmitting data the entire time that it's rising through the atmosphere. So you're, you're gonna lose the instrument. You don't care about the instrument, um, but it's also safe for flying. So obviously um, these are going up and airplanes are flying. Um, and if it hits an airplane, that's okay. Um, that's safe. So don't worry. <laughs> don't worry if a weather balloon hits your airplane, you're okay. Um, and then when it comes back down, um, for some reason, they never are really found. Um, so our prevailing winds in the northern hemisphere, at least, um, are usually from the west to the east, so from California to New York, um, which means that as the weather balloon's going up, it's traveling farther and farther um, to the east. And then when it falls down, it falls down somewhere there. So if you're launching a weather balloon, say from Boston, um, most likely that's coming down somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but if you're launching it, say from Nebraska, it's probably coming down in Iowa. Um, so that's a weather balloon. Yeah, so <laughs> but, a lot of people in the chat are wondering, so do you ever find it? And it sounds like, no, not really. Occasionally, so occasionally you do, well, we don't go out and find them because again, these are disposable instruments, um, but occasionally somebody will find it and uh, they'll call up and you know, be like, hey, we found your instrument pack. And we're like, hey, it's yours, <laughs> you win. Um, That's pretty awesome. All right, well, a couple more questions or maybe one more before we move on to our next segment of the program. Um, how far does your radar measure? So uh, how far of a radius or how large of a radius can you actually gather data from when you take the mobile radars out into the field? So our radars, um, and that's actually a very common question, um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, um, is that uh, we could see out as far as any operational radar. So we could see out 60, 70 miles, um, depending on how we configure things. But the idea is that we don't want, we don't care about what's happening that far away because then our resolution is so bad and why not just use the operational radar? Um, so the idea for us is really that we're trying to get close. Um, so we're trying to look at, you know, phenomena within say 10, 20 miles um, from the radar because we want to be close to what we're looking at so we can see things in very fine scale detail. And I won't do this on camera, but my analogy always sort of is, you know, if you're stepping way far back and you're looking, you know, at a mountaintop, you know, from far, far away, um, I don't know, maybe there's trees on there. They look a little blurry. You certainly can't tell what kind of trees they are. I'm looking at a mountain. That's why I was using that. But if you're right in front of that mountain and you're, you know, right up against it, um, you could certainly see a lot more detail. You can see what kind of rock it is. You can see what kind of trees there are. Um, and that's the same thing with our radar is this, the idea is that we're getting close to see all that type of detail. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. And uh, to a lot of the people, I see a lot of questions in the chat saying, uh, so have you ever been close to a tornado? The answer is yes. That is Dr. Kasiva's whole job is to get up close <laughs> and personal with those tornadoes. I think a lot of us, I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat say, wow, yes, that, <laughs> that is seriously cool. I think a lot of us have never seen a tornado or maybe never want to see a tornado. That is Dr. Kasiva's job. Awesome. Well, on that note, I think let's go ahead and move forward. So we're going to bring another poll up um, and we would love for you to tell us what do you want to learn about next? So we're going to give you a choice between two different types of weather and these are Dr. Kasiba's top two favorites. So you can't really go wrong. Either way, it's a good choice. We would love to know, would you like to learn more about tornadoes? or hurricanes. And again, if you are not seeing the chat pop up or the poll pop up, you can just pop your preference into the chat and we will happily take that into account. If you're watching on Facebook, you are also welcome to leave us a comment and let us know what you would like to learn a little bit more about. Again, I am watching the Facebook stream as well as the chat. We'll leave this open for another 30 seconds or so. And again, all of these good choices. Oh, I see a lot of people saying, so are you scared when you get close to tornadoes? Good question. Um, no, <laughs> not when I'm in the radar truck. That's and I, I want to say too, I, you know, I don't really want to see a tornado, um, you know, on my street. Um, I want to see a tornado up in the plains of Kansas that, you know, on an abandoned field somewhere. Um, I'm not really, I'm not really wishing for a tornado through a town or through my town or your town. But when you're in the radar truck, it's all good. All right, let's share those results. And I see a couple of comments on Facebook saying tornadoes. Oh my gosh. Oh, we were not expecting this. <laughs> 
based on the large number of Coloradans watching today that we would be talking more about tornadoes. That was just our personal guess, but it looks like more people want to learn about hurricanes. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about both of them and then tell us some extra info about hurricanes. Oh, yeah. So, wow, I did not anticipate this. Um, so actually, I will go to hurricanes then first, since you did you did say you want to learn about hurricanes. Um, again, I, they're both awesome weather and they're awesome in different ways. Um, so hopefully I could do this correctly. Yes. Okay. So my number two favorite weather is hurricanes. Um, and hurricanes, uh, as I like to say, are wet, windy, and really miserable. <laughs> um, we always have a joke here. We've done 13 different hurricane missions. And the joke is that people only come out for one mission and then they never come back out again. Um, because basically what we do is we sit in that radar truck for the entire time that the hurricane's making landfall. Um, so that picture that I'm showing you right there, that was in Galveston, Texas, um, back a few years ago. Uh, and we're parking on one of these overpasses on a highway. What we want to do is we want to get really high up because there's a lot of water, a lot of storm surge coming in with hurricanes. Um, and you can see on that lower left-hand corner there, uh, actually, uh, there's the storm surge coming up. And the storm surge actually usually comes up uh, pretty close to our truck uh, during hurricanes. So hurricanes, the big questions that we're looking at um, is we're looking at how the winds, what they're like at the surface and how they do damage. Um, so hurricanes are complicated in the sense that there's a lot of water with hurricanes. So there's a lot of something that we call storm surge, um, which basically is the ocean waves or the water waves um, really impacting the shore. So bringing um, a lot of water and the water is pretty powerful and pretty strong. Um, and that's what causes a lot of damage very close to the shore. But the other thing that can cause damage too is the winds in the hurricane. Um, so winds in a hurricane aren't as strong as winds in a tornado. Um, and I know people actually always wonder about that. Um, hurricanes are weaker than pretty much all tornadoes, but they're really, really big. Um, and they last a really long time, whereas tornadoes usually last 10, 15 minutes. Hurricanes, um, some of the strongest winds you know, could last uh, hours uh, at your location. So, like I said, we've done a bunch of different hurricane missions. Um, we've gone all the way from Texas uh, up through North Carolina. I don't know where people are at, but maybe we've hit one of your coastal locations or we've been in a hurricane that's impacted you. Um, like I said, we deploy these yellow pods um, in different places. Uh, in tornadoes, we place them you know, in the path of the tornado. In hurricanes, there's places that we think are gonna go underwater um, and we don't wanna put people, or people there. Um, so basically what we do is we put those pods there to try to still get observations, um, but not have people there. So if for some reason we're gonna lose the pod, uh, it's okay, we're not, it's okay. It's a couple thousand dollars. Um, it's much better than obviously losing people uh, in those locations. And then we you know, are in yucky places in hurricanes. Here we're in a mud field, uh, here we're you know, on a grassy levee. Um, that picture is me uh, trying to close the door in a hurricane, um, or actually not the hurricane yet, it was just uh, tropical storm force winds. Um, and obviously you can see I'm, I'm struggling there quite a bit to do that. Uh, so the really cool thing about hurricanes and the really cool thing about having a mobile radar is that we have been the first group of scientists to discover a lot of things that are going on in these different weather. And hurricanes in particular, um, we have discovered a lot of different phenomena in them that people did not know that was happening. And as I had mentioned earlier about modelers, um, modelers are really, really, really interested in our hurricane data um, because they wanna be able to get these features into their models. Uh, and we're the only group observing these features. So one of the first things that we found, the first time we went into a hurricane um, back in the 1990s, um, is we found what we call boundary layer rolls or boundary layer streaks. Um, so all these blue winds, your radar is sitting right in the middle here, all these blue and purples um, are winds blowing towards the radar, and then these reds are winds blowing away from the radar. But these pinks and these reds are really strong winds. And if you're sort of used to looking at radar data, you could see that there's kind of layers or kind of lines of these winds, um, stronger winds, weaker winds, stronger winds, weaker winds. And we hypothesized that these stronger and weaker and stronger and weaker winds, the stronger winds were actually responsible for damage in hurricanes. So what people would see after the fact in a hurricane is they'd see houses that were okay, and then they'd see a little damage path, and then they'd see houses that were okay, and then they'd see damage. Um, and that seemed to match what we're seeing with these streak uh, structures. Uh, so I'm gonna mute this, because uh, <laughs> that's what it sounds like when it's really windy in a hurricane. Um, to give you an example of what it's like in a hurricane, uh, so if you don't know what really strong wind sounds like, just you know, make a blowing noise uh, for a lot of time. Uh, so we're sitting here with our radar uh, in a hurricane. 
If you're sitting um, with your adult, go ahead and make the wind. <laughs> you will love that. Everybody loves wind noises. Um, and we kind of knew the structure was going to fail. This was not, you know, a well-built uh, structure. And these, these particular structures, things like that with awnings and nothing underneath, like gas stations, um, those are particularly susceptible to strong winds or even moderately strong winds um, in terms of uh, tearing them apart. So we were sitting there in our radar truck. It's a hurricane. You're there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. I just want to <laughs> make sure you understand the full misery of a hurricane. Um, and we're basically watching those streaks. So I showed you all those streaks, those gusts um, on the radar. So if you see on the left here, those are sort of those lines again. And what was really cool um, is that each of these streaks at different times were responsible for different points of failure in that building. So we could link actual wind gusts to actual damage that was occurring in real time. And that's really awesome because normally when damage occurs, you're not there documenting it in real time. What ends up happening is you go back after the fact. So in tornadoes and hurricanes, as soon as a tornado happens or as soon as a hurricane happens, um, engineers uh, and the weather service go out and they assess the damage then. Um, so they don't really know what the wind speeds are. They just do it based on the damage. And as you can see in this case, um, this didn't all fail at once, and it wasn't the strongest wind that brought it down. Um, it was actually the succession of all these uh, wind gusts that brought it down. Um, the other cool thing that we've seen in hurricanes, and again, um, this, is, this is what you get when you have your own radar and you're able to look at some of the things that other people aren't able to look at. Um, so there's our little blue radar truck. Um, on the left side here, you're looking at the velocity, and then on the right side here, uh, what you're looking at, are you looking at the reflectivity? So you're looking at all the rain. And all these reds here on the right side, that's what we call the eye wall of the hurricane. And that's the nastiest part of the hurricane. Um, there's a lot of rain happening. And then also correspondingly, there's a lot of wind. Um, so that's, that's the part of the hurricane that you get uh, a little bit nervous about. But for us, that's actually where we put our radar trucks. Um, we want to be in the eye wall. We want to measure these really, really strong winds. And we can't do it from the outside because hurricanes are huge. I mean, they're the size of Texas. Um, or the size of Florida. I mean, they're very big. So we can't, you know, sit far away and look at it. You actually have to go inside and look at it. So as you can see, we're actually sitting in the eye of the hurricane at this point. Um, so that's our radar truck. And then the eye is just rotating uh, around us as it's making landfall. Um, and this is Hurricane Harvey. For those of you who are hurricane fanatics, we keep looking track. Um, it was a Cat 4 hurricane that made landfall on your Corpus Christi. And then a day or so later, it just produced tons of rain over the Houston area. So after it did all its wind and hurricane thing, uh, once it made landfall, it just rained there and stalled for days. Um, so it had the double whammy of being a very strong cat for hurricane, but then also causing a lot of rain and a lot of flooding uh, in the Texas area. The one thing, and this isn't the totally uniquest observation, um, is that we saw in this, and this really requires looking at lots and lots of radar images, um, is that we saw something that we were calling tornado scale vortices. Um, so we're seeing things that look like tornadoes, but they're not tornadoes. So I want to make sure, because tornadoes can occur in hurricanes, but these are not tornadoes that we're looking at. Um, but these are little small rotations of really strong wind embedded in that already strong eyewall. And what it happens then is that these really strong winds we think are actually responsible for causing a lot of the extreme and localized damage. So that first image that I showed you that I said, oh my gosh, we discovered these boundary layer rolls. Um, and while they do have strong winds, they don't have as strong of winds as these little tornado scale vortices. So we actually think that it's these tornado scale vortices that are causing the damage in hurricanes um, or the more localized damage in hurricanes, uh, not necessarily these boundary layer rolls. And again, you have to be really adept at looking at radar data, <laughs> um, but you know, over here, you can see one of these uh, little rotations uh, coming around. Um, and they seem to be pretty prolific uh, in this eye wall. So Hurricane Harvey was actually the strongest hurricane that I've ever been in. Um, I've been in seven hurricanes and I was sitting in the radar truck uh, the whole time that Hurricane Harvey was making landfall. And the real fun thing about hurricanes too, besides that you're in them forever, is that every hurricane I've been in, it seems to make landfall at night. So you're just sort of sitting in this dark radar truck and you can't see anything. You hear the wind howling and every once in a while you see debris flying by, um, but otherwise you can't really see much. Um, but we were at an airport uh, very near the shore because like I said, we want to be right there as the hurricane is making landfall. Um, so I was sitting in this radar truck, um, this big tall thing that you see sticking out the top, um, that's for radio communications. But the other thing it has on there is what we call an anemometer. 
um, which also is a way of measuring winds. And during the peak of Harvey, we measured winds of 145 miles an hour um, at our location. So it was pretty windy. <laughs> it was pretty dark. It was pretty windy. Um, and actually part of um, our observations and nearby observations um, are really what helped give uh, Hurricane Harvey the Cat 4 rating, um, was that we measured wind gusts um, that were Cat 4 wind gusts. And just to show you um, nearby, so this uh, top thing there with that car you see, um, those, that was the damage that was happening very near our radar truck. Um, so that car got lofted, that building got destroyed, um, and there was no water. We were away from the water there, so this is not surge damage. Um, this is a lot of wind damage. And our data combined with our other da our anemometer data, our radar data combined with that anemona anemometer data, how was good to say, um, combined with some other people's measurements, um, really was getting, got a really good map of winds and damage uh, that occurred in Harvey. And really, that's what we're trying to do in these hurricanes, is understand how these winds um, are doing damage. So that's my quick, quick hurricane spiel. Um, so I'm going to look to Talia for my time. Yes, we have about <laughs> 10 minutes left. Um, How many? I think about 10 minutes. And okay. so we will have a, a time for a quick presentation on tornadoes because I know we have a lot of tornado fans, but we do also have some questions about hurricanes that I would love to throw to you now if you are ready for them. Um, Want to thank our audience for some really incredible questions. It's been great to see those come in. And to our Facebook audience, if you have a specific question about tornadoes or hurricanes, again, I am watching the Facebook stream and we'll be able to pull your comments um, and relay them to our featured scientists. So let's see some of our hurricane questions. We did have a lot of people wondering, we've heard things about the mythical eye of the hurricane and I know that's not mythical I know that's a real <laughs> sort of we hear about it all the time with like ooh, the eye of the hurricane so what is the eye of the hurricane and why is it significant right so the eye of the hurricane is very interesting and certainly has a lot of people talking about it um so the eye of the hurricane um is that clear region where so when you see a satellite image of a hurricane um and I can real quick just so I have it up just so you're looking at it that eye, so that center part there, that clear part of the hurricane, um, what's happening there is you're actually getting sinking air coming down. Um, and it's relatively quiescent, uh, so relatively quiet um, in the eye of the hurricane, not too windy, um, compared to what's happening right around the eye of the hurricane, uh, that eye wall, so surrounding the eye, is where your nasty winds are occurring. So the funny thing I'll just say about the eye wall, since people, or the eye, since people, you know, Look at these satellite images and you always see like these uh, the NOAA planes out there, uh, you know, going through the hurricane and then in the nice eye with that stadium effect. Um, as hurricanes are making landfall, usually what's happening is it's the eye is falling apart um, because as soon as you start hitting land, you're starting to lose the energy for the hurricane because the hurricane is really getting all its energy from the ocean beneath it. And then what happens is that you don't get that cool stadium effect in the eye. So usually what happens, and sometimes it's good, it's nice and warmer, and you can get out actually um, and do some things um, because you've just experienced the eye wells, you've just experienced the worst winds, and then it calms down. Um, and then what's gonna happen then is the rear eye wall um, is coming ashore. And Harvey, for example, Harvey stayed intact pretty well as it made landfall, which is very unusual um, for a hurricane. And what that meant is when the eye wall did come ashore at night, or the eye came ashore at night, um, it was really quiet. There, it wasn't windy at all. We went and we drove around, we all went to the bathroom. Um, but the nasty part about that was that since Harvey remained intact and the eye remained intact, is that the rear eye wall, so the next part of the nasty winds, were really nasty. So they were just as nasty as the first part. And like I said, usually hurricanes are falling apart and then the rear eye wall is just nothing. Um, you could almost actually drive out of there during the rear eye wall. Um, since Harvey stayed together, uh, it was it was nasty on both ends. So if you're experiencing a good eye, that's probably not a good thing <laughs> for what's coming after that. Great question, and thank you for those answers. Um, I do actually see a lot of questions. I think a lot of people are wondering, what is it like to actually sit in the mobile radar when a hurricane is coming on shore? And a couple people are like, wait, so you just sit in the truck <laughs> and it's dark and there's debris flying around? Aren't you worried it's gonna hit you? So what is the experience of actually being in the mobile, mobile radar like when that hurricane is coming on shore? Yeah, I, I actually don't have good video for that because I mean, it's just gray outside. So even when it's light out, it's just gray. Um, yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's nerve wracking, right? I mean, so everybody here has probably ridden in a car and you've ridden in a car at highway speed. So 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. 
um, you know, and a hurricane's coming to shore with winds of 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. Um, so sometimes think every once in a while, you know, when you're driving on the highway, I don't know if you ever experienced what we call a crosswind. So it sort of hits the side of the car and you kind of are like, oh, you know, think of that though for like 12 hours. So basically you're just sitting there. It's very nerve wracking at the beginning because you can't move. Once you've made a decision, you hope your decision was right. Um, and then you just start getting really tired because you put a lot of effort into finding a place to deploy. It's sort of warm and wet. Um, the radar leaks. <laughs> you're trying to keep the radar operating. Um, it's really tricky to keep it operating because um, you're getting, you know, 80 mile an hour salt spray winds into our electronics. Um, so it's really challenging, but there's also sometimes in some ways not a lot you can do. Um, so it's this sort of oscillation between complete boredom and sort of, oh my God, what am I doing <laughs> for 12 hours? <laughs> It sounds like a thrill ride for sure. And there, we'll take one more quick one before we talk a little bit about tornadoes. And then I think that'll be our time. We're coming close to the end of our time together today. A lot of people are wondering, so wait, how does the truck not tip over? How does it not fly up in the air? Can you tell us a little bit about some of the ways that the mobile radar is a safe shelter for all of you, or at least mostly safe? Mostly. Yeah, and that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't want to be in a, <laughs> I don't want to be in an unsafe location um, and I don't want to be in an unsafe truck. So when we deploy our radars, uh, first of all, I just wanna say they're heavy. So they weigh about 25,000 pounds. Um, your typical car weighs about 3,000 pounds, a pickup truck, maybe 6,000 pounds. Um, so we're really pretty heavy. Um, so there's that, so we have gravity working for us. Um, the other thing is that when we park our radar truck, we park our radar truck into the wind. So as the hurricane's making landfall, we know the direction that the winds are coming. Um, so there, like I said, there's a lot of prep and a lot of decision-making that go into where we're putting our truck and how we're positioning it. So back to my highway analogy, when you're sort of driving into the wind, it's kind of okay, right? You're going 80 miles an hour. Um, the really tricky part, like I said, is when you start getting some of those crosswinds um, or if you've made a decision and you start getting debris at your location. Again, that isn't gonna make the radar truck flip um, and it's a pretty armored radar truck, uh, but you, know, you start getting debris hitting, say for example, your windshield or the back of the truck or the radar dish um, because things are coming apart near you. Um, again, we try not to do that, um, but sometimes that's a little bit inevitable. All right. That, I mean, it sounds fascinating and maybe everyone can tell us in the chat and in the comments on Facebook, if you would want to sit in a radar truck for 12 hours, <laughs> Some people join us today because to them, that sounds like an amazing time. Other people are like, nope, I would Like I said, we always get people once. <laughs> there you go. One time. Well, we have just about four or five minutes left, so perhaps you can give us a quick walkthrough of what tornadoes are like, since we have so many tornado fans with us today, and then we will sign off and say goodbye. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Sorry, I, I anticipated tornadoes more. Um, so <laughs> it is my top favorite weather. And this is a sped up uh, image of a tornado. Again, you know, if you really want tornado imagery, you're not looking at the scientists for it. <laughs> you should go on, you know, Google or YouTube. Um, but this is that Wyoming tornado that I've been showing you ad nauseum. This is really cool because one of our big questions in tornado research is how do tornadoes form, which I think, or I hope some of you will be asking me that. Um, and then the other question is what are the winds like inside them? So very basic questions, um, but tornadoes are very hard phenomena uh, to study. Um, so the big question, first of all, is which storms are going to make tornadoes and which ones aren't? And the problem is these storms that we call supercells, um, which supercells are supercells, no, um, they're rotating thunderstorms. Um, and they happen a lot. They happen all through the Great Plains. They happen up in the Great Plains in Canada as well. Um, and they're pretty common. But some of these supercells make tornadoes. And supercells are most likely to make the strongest tornadoes. Uh, but the question is, which ones make tornadoes and which ones don't? Um, so looking at them visually, um, you can't tell which one's going to make a tornado or which one isn't. Uh, and looking at them in radars, it's pretty hard to tell which one's going to make a tornado and which one uh, isn't. So what we do with our radars is we try to get um, in front of these storms before they make a tornado. Um, and the reason I keep showing this Wyoming storm is because this is one of the only or one of the few storms that we actually got to our radar location before the storm made a tornado. Usually we're sort of jockeying as the storm's making a tornado. Um, and this is what we call a supercell. This is what it looks like in radar. Again, remember, we're taking these horizontal cross sections um, and you're looking at reflectivity. So you're looking at all the rain and all that kind of stuff. And this little thing that curls up on the end there, that's the tornado. Um, and as you can see, this loop stops at some point. The reason it stops is because we were sitting right there um, and we wanted to run away from the tornado. Um, so again, unlike hurricanes, um, where we do sit in them, uh, tornadoes, um, we certainly don't want to be uh, in a tornado. The winds in tornadoes are much, much stronger than they are um, in a hurricane. So a quick uh, thing of what we're looking at um, in tornadoes and 
it's something uh, that I call the Goldilocks downdraft. Um, so I told you these storms, they rotate, these big supercell storms rotate. Um, that the other thing that these supercell storms have, and they all have it, is something called a downdraft, a rear flank downdraft. And basically the storm is rotating and then something wraps around the back end of the storm. And depending on how this downdraft wraps around the back end of the storm, depending on how warm or cool it is, how much moisture it has in it, um, it may or may not be favorable for making a tornado. Um, so depending on, um, I guess I always look at this plane doing a horrible landing. Um, so the downdraft doesn't tilt up. That's for making the mesocyclone part of the tornado or mesocyclone part of the storm. What a downdraft does, and every meteorologist always needs a pen when they're talking about rotating things, um, is instead of tilting it up, the downdraft is used to tilt rotation downward. Um, so you get, there's a lot of rotation going around in these storms, but what you want is something to tilt it downward. But it has to have just the right properties to tilt it downward. Because if it's too cold, what'll happen is it just is too dense and it just sinks and you can't really converge the air. But if it's too warm, you actually can't get enough rotation going um, in order to make a tornado. So that's why we're looking for this sort of Goldilocks downdraft. And there's a lot of details that go into this, um, but we're certainly really trying to figure out um, a lot more about this downdraft and how it forms and its properties. And I see Talia, so I've talked my four minutes. <laughs> But it's a good place to end um, because that's sort of where we are um, in terms of trying to figure out how these supercell storms make tornadoes. I am muted. That's why no one could hear me. Um, it sounds like what we really need is for all of you who tuned in to watch today to grow up to be meteorologists, to be atmospheric scientists, and to keep studying these severe storms. Because as Dr. Kasipa mentioned, there is still a whole lot that we don't know about these phenomenons of weather that can affect so many of us. You know, I've seen several people. I do want to say a thank you to all of you who have shared some of your personal stories. A lot of you chimed in in the chat today to say, my house was actually hit by a hurricane years ago and it was really damaged. Or I I remember seeing a tornado once when I went to go visit my grandma in Nebraska and it was really scary. You know, these are really personal events. And I think when, when we experience all of these things, I remember my first tornado really, really strongly. Um, you know, these are our stories that really stick with us. So what we need is for all of you to help study these events that affect all of our lives so deeply. Um, so grow up, become meteorologists, and maybe you too will get to sit in a radar truck for 12 hours <laughs> while the hurricane blows over the top of you. It's important work. Thank you everybody for joining us today. It was really wonderful to get to connect with you. We are so happy that technology allows us um, to be able to still connect with you and hear your questions, even though we are all staying safe in our homes. And we look so forward to resuming normal operations um, at some point down the line, welcoming you all back to the museum with important or with open arms. Um, it was really great to get to talk to you today. Thank you everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye.